Hello and welcome along to a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's go exploring. My name is Dan. Thank you for being there, for listening and streaming. This is the show where we explore what's going on around the universe. If you're a bit bored by life down here on planet Earth, if you're not excited by how things are panning out, then hop aboard. We are travelling around the universe searching some science secrets that hopefully lurk nearby. This week, we'll learn all about dark spots on the planet Neptune and why they keep popping up and then disappearing and then popping up again. When Voyager 2 flew past Neptune in 1989 and it saw this large sort of dark spot in Neptune's atmosphere. And we didn't really know much about it. We knew it was dark. Uh, we knew that um, it was probably deep and it had sort of high clouds around it. We know it's a kind of storm, but it, it had never been seen before. Uh, we didn't have the uh, spacecraft to see it before. But since Voyager passed by, the great dark spot has disappeared uh, entirely. But since then, other dark spots have appeared occasionally, every sort of three, four years. Uh, either in the north or the south. Um, And that's what my study's been looking at. Also, we'll head to the smartest school in the solar system, Deep Space High, learning about jobs that you can do across the universe if you love English at school. We need great science communicators, people who can describe and report on missions and discoveries in a way that makes other people keen to know more, especially young people who might want to work in space themselves. And I've got your questions to answer this week. They are on infinity and how big it is and why you rub your eyes when you're tired. It's on the way in a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's start things off with your science in the news. Something big to kick off this week. Many experts now have no doubts that there is life in the universe. Instead of asking whether there is life there... They're now convinced enough to ask, when will we find that life? NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, which we've spoken about loads on the show, it's found hints of life on a planet outside of our solar system, really, for the first time. It's found loads more planets that perhaps could hold life too. Now the search is on for a planet that they say is in the Goldilocks zone. Uh, It's not too hot and it's not too cold, you see, just like in the Goldilocks and the Three Bears story. And it's just right for there to be water on there, which might signal life on another planet. Now, this is brilliant news. Um, I've spoken to loads of scientists doing this show and they've all said, well, the universe is so big that it's more than likely there are more life there than just us. The thing is, for me right now, hopefully for you too, I want to still be alive when we find these aliens. Also, for life back here on planet Earth, it's not looking, well, brilliant. Scientists say that one in six creatures in the UK is at risk of extinction. They say many animals are losing their home because humans are destroying it and because of the changing climate. Animals like turtle doves and dormice are particularly at risk in the UK, as experts say a move to wildlife-friendly farming and fishing is vital. Now, I understand that for farmers and for fishers, there is so much talk about like what they need to do, what they need to change because of the climate crisis. And this is just another problem that they need to think about. But it really is vital because us humans can't keep going around damaging the ecosystem that we also find ourselves in because we're all part of the same thing, if you think about it. And New York City was brought to a standstill last week as flash flooding filled the streets. Torrential rain flooded roads with people leaving their cars there and some cars even floating away. It just came, the rains dropped, the floods hit and then it kind of disappeared really. Very bizarre. Let's catch up with Techno Mum then. She is one of our favourite geniuses on the show because she knows all about gadgets and tech and all the answer to your gadget and tech questions. Uh, We're finding out the exciting engineering with Tim and his mum Techno Mum this week and we're having a clear out of the loft because we don't really need physical copies of things that we remember and things that we love anymore. We can store everything digitally instead. Let's take a listen. Technomum with the Institution of Engineering and Technology. Advancing and sharing technology. Mum was clearing out the spare room and all sorts of interesting things were appearing. Stuff I'd not seen for ages. Oh, wow. Look, it's the water pistols we got in Spain. I could have sworn I'd thrown them out. Well, I'm afraid they're in the bin pile. 
There isn't enough room in the loft for everything. And my swimming certificate. And Dad's ice skates. And how many folders of paper? Hang on, what are all these? There was a shoebox full of funny black square things, each one about the size of my hand. They had sticky labels on them, and the bigger ones had a hole in the middle. Ha! Floppy disks! There's something you might not have seen before. They're for saving computer files onto, or for loading up programmes and games. But your laptop hasn't got a hole for those. It's got a CD drive, and smaller holes for those little memory sticks. But nothing big enough for a huge bit of plastic like this. Well, that's how fast technology moves on. Twenty years ago, you might have used these yourself. Twenty years before that, it would have been papers and folders. Like this lot here. You can see how the floppy disk seemed amazing next to all these paper files to store. And a lot lighter too. Phew. <laughs> yeah. And now I can just shove my homework on a tiny memory stick, can't I? And your memory stick, it's called a USB stick, can hold as much info as a hundred of these big floppy disks. But here's the cool thing, Tim. In a few years, you won't even need a USB stick. Haven't they taught you about cloud computing at school? Not sure about that. We'd done clouds, but that was in geography, not computing. Don't think so. Well, instead of loading programs and saving your files to and from a place on your computer or onto a memory stick, it's likely you'll save it to a place on the internet instead. What's the internet got to do with clouds? It's just a figure of speech. The internet is sometimes referred to by engineers as the cloud, and it's drawn like one on diagrams, just because it's big and it seems to hover above us, with so much in it that we can't see. And we don't need to see or understand how it works to use it. <laughs> That's right. Even Great Grandad can use the internet. Cheeky. Of course he can. He used to be one of the top code breakers in the Second World War. He's a better engineer than me. But yes, you just log on and off you go. So with cloud computing, you can use files that are stored on the internet. Save your files to the internet, and that leaves your computer a lot tidier. With no piles of files cluttering up the space. Got it in one. I looked at the pile of things that were going into the loft. They seemed like important things. I wouldn't like someone else to be looking after my old swimming certificates. I worked hard for them. But what if the cloud loses things? What if the computer files in the cloud get destroyed? I can understand what you mean, but it's really quite difficult to lose things on the internet. And the files are far more likely to get corrupted or lost on your own PC. Anyway... I wish there was a cloud to put all this lot in. The loft's getting very full now. Oh, you can't throw this, Mum. Hammy's old hamster cage? No, it's horrible. But we need to remember, Hammy. I don't need to remember the blooming cage, though. Bin. Techno Mum, with the Institution of Engineering and Technology. Advancing and sharing technology. Let's get to your questions this week then. Uh, there are so many ways that you can ask a question, that you can be a star of the podcast. I really love hearing from you. I love you to get on the free Fun Kids app or you get to funkidslive.com and you can send a voice memo to me there. Then I know uh, who you are, what you're thinking. I can hear your question. So make sure you get to that because we have loads of bonus episodes filled with your questions if you subscribe to the show on Fun Kids Podcasts Plus. Uh, now, this question has been sent in through the uh, Apple Podcast Store. They have found the Fun Kids Science Weekly page on there and dropped us a review. Thank you so much to Snow Leopard, who wants to know how big is infinity? Well, it's massive. Infinity isn't really a number like a hundred or a thousand. It's the biggest number that you can imagine. And then you add a couple to that as well. The idea of it, it's more a theory that we're never finding the limit, that we never find the edge, that whatever we can imagine is always growing. If you imagine a huge number, infinity is even more than that. So that's how big infinity is. And get this, there are even numbers bigger than infinity. It takes a very special space and science genius to work that out. Maybe we'll get uh, someone on the show who specialises in that to talk and run us through it in the next few weeks or so. Thank you so much, Snow Leopard. This one comes in from Jay, uh, who sent this uh, over to my page at funkidslive.com. Jay wants to know, why do we rub our eyes when we're tired? And also, why do we yawn? Well, when you're tired, the muscles and skin around your eyes are tired too. So they can't work properly. 
you know, when you, you're quite exhausted, you have trouble focusing. It's because the muscles have trouble kind of pulling your eyes in the right direction. When you rub your eyes, it makes them water a bit, which greases the muscles, a bit like putting oil in a car. And it greases the skin around it as well to help you use them, to help the muscles uh, expand or contract. And it helps you focus on what you need to do. So that's why you rub your eyes when you're tired and you yawn because your lungs haven't got enough oxygen in them. Because maybe you've been breathing quite shallowly. So you take one deep deep breath to get more in. So that's why you might yawn when you're at school or something. It's not really because you're bored. Maybe you've just been sitting in the same spot for a little while and your lungs have been quite bad at breathing. So you take a deep breath to get more air in so you can stay alert. So that is why you yawn, Jay. Thank you so much for the question. If there is anything you want answered on the podcast next week, make sure you leave it as a voice note for me on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslive.com. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. This week, travelling across the galaxy, talking about dark spots in space and why sometimes they vanish. Professor Patrick Irwin from the University of Oxford has been looking into this. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thank you for having me. So we've known about dark spots for a little while. They were discovered on Neptune back in the 80s. What did we know about it back then? Well, Voyager 2 flew past Neptune in 1989 and it saw this large sort of dark spot in Neptune's atmosphere, which um, similar sort of size to the great dark spot in Jupiter. And we didn't really know much about it. We knew it was dark. Uh, we knew that um, it was probably deep and it had sort of high clouds around it. We know it's a kind of storm, but it, it had never been seen before. And uh, obviously because uh, we didn't have the uh, spacecraft to see it before. Um, But since Voyager passed by, um, the Great Dark Spot has disappeared uh, entirely. Uh, So it wasn't seen in telescope measurements made after that. But but since then, other dark spots have appeared occasionally, every sort of three, four years, uh, either in the north or the south. Um, And that's what my study has been looking at. So before your study, I know you perhaps weren't working on this back in the 80s, but you might have a grasp of it. How would scientists have possibly got their head around something that appeared and then disappeared? Uh, We've got no quick way of trying to figure out what they were. A lot of this would have been ideas and theory, surely. So how would they have gone about trying to guess what it was? Right. So Neptune is is one of the gas giants. There's no there's no hard surface. You can't you can't land on the surface of Neptune and wander around. It's, it's a massively thick atmosphere and it's swirling away. And, and what we see basically is weather. The dark spot was was thought to be a massive sort of storm of, of some way, um, which and, and all the planets have storms and and they have storms because um, the, 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 there's heat from in one place trying to get out somewhere else. And in the case of uh, Neptune, you've got sunlight coming in, which heats it up. And you've also got uh, internal heat left over from when it formed. Uh, and that heat needs to get out. And so the atmosphere has to overturn somehow to move that heat. And it seems that on the giant planets like Jupiter and uh, Saturn and, and Neptune, this, this occasionally shows itself as massive sort of storms, which uh, last for you know, several years. For Jupiter, it's lasted for hundreds of years uh, with a great, great red spot. Um, but for Neptune, it seems to be a shorter lived kind of event. So then you kind of take the reins with your team and, and you want to find out a bit more about it. So what was your study? What did you look at and how did you go about finding it? Right. So um, so I say these dark spots, you know, the, the great dark spot is gone, but new dark spots appear now and again. And in 2018, a, a new dark spot was seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. And as luck would have it, we had time the year after to observe Neptune with uh, one of the instruments on the very large telescope, a very imaginative name. The very large <laughs> telescope um, is, in, uh, is in Chile, a part of the European Southern Observatory. And there's an instrument on there called MUSE, which is a very cunning thing. Uh, because it's an instrument that, um, you know, if you think about looking at a, an image of a planet, and you, you've got the brightness across the disk, um, well, for Muse, you could do that, but each pixel in that image contains all the visible colours that you can see. It's so uh, you can you can take you can turn it into a complete spectrum, and that's very important because you know we all we knew before the study was that the uh, these spots were dark at blue wavelengths, but we didn't know quite how that darkness varied with wavelength um, and that's if you can measure that then you can say a lot more about where in the atmosphere it is so how, how deep in the atmosphere it is and then hopefully get some idea about what it actually is 
well, you were discussing weather and you were discussing kind of gas and things left over from the formations of these planets. What has your studies led you to believe that these black spots might be? Yes. Yeah, so what we've what we've realised is that these spots really are very very deep. And the, the current model we have now is that uh, when you're looking at Neptune, you can see sort of um, cloud and haze at three different levels. At the very top, there's the bright white sort of methane cloud you see in a sort of haze, uh, and then in the middle there's a sort of fairly uniform layer of haze and methane ice at a pressure of about one or two bars. So on the Earth, the regular Earth pressure is one bar. So if you're down at two bars, the pressure is twice as deep as you are on the surface of the Earth. And then below that, we think there's a, a cloud of haze and hydrogen sulfide ice, which um, on the top of that is down at sort of five bars. So that's five times the Earth surface pressure. And we think that, well, we've, we've shown that the, the dark spot is caused by a darkening of that deepest layer. So a darkening of that hydrogen sulfide layer. Why it's dark, we don't know. <laughs> we, uh, we think it's some, uh, some, some dark material has been introduced there, and it could be because sort of chemicals are coming from below, or it could be because there's it's slightly hotter in that region, which might evaporate the ice away. We're not really sure what is causing the darkness, but at least we now know uh, at what level in the atmosphere we're looking at. Because we've noticed these dark spots before, and then they vanish, and we don't mm. we don't kind of always know how long they will last for. Are studies like yours almost a race against time that you need to know everything you can and and look at it for as long as you can before it disappears suddenly again? Yes. So if if something exciting happens, you can apply for uh, it's called director's discretionary time to go and have a quick look, and and then you are rushing to make, you know, get the the observation uploaded and ready. Uh, in this case, we actually had a program uh, which was uh, just happened to be looking at the right time, um, and so that was that was very fortunate. Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Sorry, you, you mentioned you have to apply for time. Yeah, is, is that you apply for time to use the very large telescope, almost like a calendar online, where you have to book in how long you want it for? You, yeah, well, no, you you have to um, uh, you have to sort of write a proposal for what you want to do and why, and why it's scientifically interesting and why. Why the VLT should um, would give should give you their instrument wow. for this time, and then it gets assessed. And if you get uh, um, pro- approved, you then have to basically write a sort of program, um, which is uploaded to the telescope. And then, uh, as part of the normal procedures, you know, every night the telescope will looking at will be looking at all sorts of things, and hopefully your observation comes up in the queue to be measured now. And they'll slew the telescope around and look at Neptune for as long as you want them to do, and then they move on to the next thing. So it's uh, it's it's sort of a a way of trying to maximise the efficiency of having this massive telescope, which is is fantastic, and everyone wants to use. And, and we don't know how long these dark spots tend to be visible for. They tend to be visible for a year or two or three. You know, so it's, it's not it's not hard uh, hard and fast. Uh, so so um, this one appeared in, in 2018 and disappeared in 2022, and that's a sort of that's a sort of typical length. But, but there's no sort of pattern as to whether they appear in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. We, we, we know they appear at sort of mid-latitudes, sort of 30, you know, 20 to 30s, north or south. And then after a while, they sort of drift down towards the equator and then somehow uh, disappear. And we don't know why. So, so you know, it's, it's important to keep looking at these planets to see. I mean, maybe one day we'll see one of these dark spots um, in the form, in the act of appearing. Or maybe we'll see a dark spot in the act of, of decaying away and disappearing. Um, and that just underlines how important it is to keep looking at these planets to see what might be going on. It's amazing, isn't it, that science has got to a point now where it's so uh, factual and we know so much and we've got all this technology available to us. But yet still for something like this, it's a case of keeping our fingers crossed that we are looking at the right time. Just one last question. Um, How important is a discovery like this to all the other questions that we're asking about the universe and our place in it and about why we're here are we hoping that in the dark spots there could be answers to some of those mega important questions or are we just looking at it because it's nice to learn more about space the way i always talk about this is that obviously we have um the weather on the earth um and we have very good models for um modeling how they behave but you know i mean it's uh, it's, a, it's a physical system it's uh, there's an atmosphere there's heating there's cooling there's all sorts of other things happening and we have just the one Earth. And, and normally when you're doing experiments, you take your model and you, you tweak it and you, and you adjust it and you see what happens to understand better what's going on. And ideally, you don't want to do that with the Earth's atmosphere because, because we, we live in it and we're dependent on it. But 
if you look at the atmospheres of other planets, you can see you know, the same physics happening, but with very different sort of um, uh, temperatures and very different sort of forcings. And so we're hoping that by understanding the atmospheres of other planets better, we understand as well that our own atmosphere better. Well, it's been a real uh, treat to understand this a bit better. Patrick Irwin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right, then it's time for this week's Dangerous Dan, where we look at some of the most mean, weird, strange, unique and evil (laughs) things in the universe. And this week we are headed to the warm tropical forests of South America to talk about a strange plant with an incredibly deadly name. Devil's Trumpets is a better name, another name, for the plant Brugmansia. Devil's Trumpets, it's much more exciting to say. They're in the nightshade family, who we've spoken about on this podcast before. The plants can grow tall, the stems up to 11 metres high. They're coated in small, fine hairs. It's their flowers that gives them this wicked name. They are long, reddish, pinky, and they droop, they sag down with a wide, billowing opening, a bit like a trumpet, and they can be deadly. The seeds and the leaves of this plant are rich in many toxins. Just a small taste of them can make your muscles weak, set your heart racing, give you awful headaches, make you delirious, start you seeing things. And it makes you violently sick too, and then you could die by just a small bite of the seed of the Brugmansia, which looks like a very wicked musical instrument. And that's why it's called a Devil's Trumpet, which is why the Devil's Trumpet goes straight onto our Dangerous Down list. Before we finish up this week, let's take one last adventure and head to the smartest school in the solar system, headed to Deep Space High now. Uh, This is part of our Space for All series. We've been travelling up there, getting a lesson with Professor Pulsar and the gang for the last few weeks, all about the different types of jobs and careers that you can do in space, because there are loads more that you can do up there than just being an astronaut. Because there are so much more than you can do up there than just being an astronaut. This week, we'll find out what sort of jobs you can get in space if you love English. Deep Space High. Space for all. Morning, class. Right, who can remind us what we've learned about careers in space? Sam? That it's not all about rocket scientists and that space is for everyone? Correct! Although rocket scientists are important if you want to get off the ground. So today, um, tricks. Why don't you get us started by telling us what your favourite subject is and we'll see how you might turn your skills to the stars. Well, my favourite subject is English. I especially love writing stories, but space is more about facts, I guess, not fiction. English is integral to space exploration, and fiction has its place too. We need great science communicators, people who can describe and report on missions and discoveries in a way that makes other people keen to know more, especially young people who might want to work in space themselves. Oh, that's like that magazine we get, Andromeda Express. It's full of the latest cool mission news and spacecraft. I guess someone had to write the articles in it. That's right, but there's an even more exciting way writers are part of space exploration. Anyone a fan of science fiction books or movies? Me, sir. You mean films like Star Trek with Captain Kirk and Spock on the Starship Enterprise? Or Ready Player One, that film where everyone lives in virtual reality? Yep. Science fiction is where the writer imagines what life might be like in the future, sometimes on Earth, sometimes on other planets. But it's only imagining, isn't it? How does that help? Let's see. Computer sim, Paramount Studios, USA. The original Star Trek TV series in the 1960s showed characters using small devices to communicate with each other, which led to the invention of the first mobile phone, because the inventor, Martin Cooper, was a fan of the show and was inspired by the idea. Next, computer sim Blade Runner, a movie set in a future America where robots live alongside humans. We're in a self-driving car. That's right. This film came out in 1982, many years before such a thing was invented for real life. It existed in the writer's imagination all those years before. One more sim, hold on to your hats. Whoa! 
We're rushing towards Earth at 100 miles an hour. Actually, we're inside Google Earth, an app that lets you zoom in on anywhere on Earth. It's said the designers got the idea from a science fiction book called Snow Crash. Oops, getting a bit too close now. End sim. For you. People who are expert communicators can tell the stories of what we're doing in space and what we might do in the future. Inspiring real missions and technology is more powerful than you think. There's even a saying, the pen is mightier than the sword. Bit difficult to do your homework with a sword, though. <laughs> Science fiction has even changed the language we use. Did you know that the words robotics, cyberspace, zero gravity, gas giant, avatar and computer virus were all coined by science fiction writers? No way! So, Sam, you were struggling to think about things you like to do. Maybe you'd like to write an exciting science fiction story. I think I'd prefer to read them. Or actually, just watch a movie. <laughs> there must be something you like to do, other than as little as possible. Never mind, Sam. Our search will continue. Learning how whatever your interests, space is a place for all. All right, class dismissed. Beam me up, Scotty. Deep Space High, space for all. With support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at funkislive.com slash space. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. If you have anything science that you want answered on the show next week, make sure you leave it as a voice note for me on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslive.com. Now, Fun Kids, we've got loads more brilliant episodes and podcasts that you heard today. Tons more for you to have a listen to on the free Fun Kids app at Google, uh, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your shows there at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station that you can listen to all around the country on the free Fun Kids app on funkidslive.com or if you've got a smart speaker wake it up and ask it to play fun kids